Anybody here uh, know the name Robin Williams? <laughs> you smile, don't you? Um, I'm not a big fan of a lot of movies, but I will say that uh, Patch Adams affected me when I watched it, talking about how humor helps heal. Um, so today I'm going to take liberties, because I am not your pastor. I'm going to take a liberty to read something to you that really profoundly affected me. I, as I was reading through some of Robin Williams' uh, stuff, and, and granted, I do not uh, value his language sometimes, just like I don't value my own personal character faults sometimes, and yours sometimes. Um, but one thing that as I was doing some reading, and, and we were discussing it at home, I heard him uh, quoted as saying this, and it made a huge impact on me. He said, it gets really hard to follow the best. He had to follow Robin Williams. Every time he got up to do comedy, he had to make sure he was as good as Robin Williams was the last time. I never stopped to think of the the pressure that must have put on him. And I'm not here to, to talk about why he did what he did or how he did it or what the issues were because I don't understand that and I'm thankful that my Heavenly Father is the one in charge of all of that. But I am here to say today, as Paul would say, I'm just reminding you of something you already know. So today, because I like stories, I'm going to read you a few stories but I hope the point you never forget. And, and the point is really literally this. If you don't think you make a difference, you do. Uh, if nothing else, remember the African proverb that says, if you think you are too small to make a difference, you haven't spent the night with a mosquito. You do make a difference. Um, this book was really affected me, so if you don't mind, I'm just going to read it. In 1963, Edward Lorenz presented a hypothesis to the New York Academy of Sciences. Theory stated simply this. A butterfly could flap its wings, set molecules of air in motion, which would move other molecules of air in turn, moving other molecules of air, eventually capable of starting a hurricane on the other side of the planet. Wow. His ideas were literally laughed out of the conference, but what he had proposed was ridiculous. It was preposterous, and therefore, because of the idea, although it was charming and intriguing, called the butterfly effect, became a staple of science fiction remaining for decades, a combination of myth, legend that spread only in comic books and bad movies. So imagine the scientific community's shock and surprise when more than 30 years after that possibility was introduced, physics professors working from colleges and universities worldwide came to the conclusion that the butterfly effect was authentic, accurate, and viable. Soon afterward, it was accorded the state of a law now known as the law of sensitive dependence upon initial conditions. Science got a hold of it. This principle has proven to be a force encompassing more than butterfly wings. Scientists have shown that butterfly effect to engage with the first movement of any form of matter, including you. So then the story begins. Did you know that there once existed a single man who more than a century ago made one move that still dramatically affects how you live today. He was 34-year-old school teacher, but on a hot, humid day of July 2, 1863, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain was in the fight of his life. A former professor of rhetoric from Bedouin College in Maine, he was now a colonel in the Union Army. Chamberlain stood at the far left of the edge of the group of 80,000 men strung out in a line across fields and hills, stretching all the way to the little town called Gettysburg. Earlier that day, a Colonel Vincent 
had placed Chamberlain and his men of the 20th Maine at the end of the line saying, whatever you do, you can't let them come through here. Chamberlain couldn't withdraw and he knew it. If the Confederate army overran them, the rebels would gain the high ground and the Union army would quickly be defeated. In essence, 80,000 men would be caught from behind on the downhill charge with no protection. To win, the gray-clad Confederates would have to come through Chamberlain, a 34-year-old schoolteacher. At 2.30 p.m., the first charge came from the 15th and the 47th Alabama regiments. They attacked uphill, running as fast as they could and firing at Chamberlain's men who were stationed behind a rock wall they had thrown up that very morning. The 20th Maine stopped the rebel charge and pushed them back down the slope only to face a second charge and then a third charge. On the fourth assault, Chamberlain was knocked down by a bullet that hit him dead center in the belt buckle. Realizing that he wasn't seriously hurt, the colonel scrambled to his feet, continuing to fight. Again, they halted the enemy's charge, and again, the rebels retreated down the hill. At that time in history, battles were fought with artillery and small arms ammunition. The struggles were close face-to-face -face affairs. With their fourth charge, the Confederates almost made it to the wall. A thigh-high stack of flat rocks that ran almost 110 yards in length. As they waited for the next charge, Chamberlain felt sorry for his men. He later recalled their leader had no real knowledge of warfare and tactics. I was only a stubborn man, and that was my greatest advantage in this fight. Listen to what he said, and this is a quote. I had deep within me the inability to do nothing. Let me say that again. I had deep within me the inability to do nothing. Chamberlain continued, I knew I may die, but I also knew that I would not die with a bullet in my back. <laughs> I, would, I would not die in retreat. I am at least like the Apostle Paul who wrote, and he quotes, this one thing I do, I press toward the mark. The attack came. On this, the 5th charge, the 15th and the 47th Alabama broke open the wall and fighting raged on both sides. Without time to reload, the men were swinging their rifles at each other and brawling with fists and knives. Somehow, the 20th Maine pushed the rebels downhill one more time. After that 5th broken charge, Chamberlain's younger brother, Tom, appeared with Sergeant Tozier, an old hard-nosed soldier. Tolger had a thick wad of torn shirt stuck in a hole in his shoulder where he'd been wounded. No help from the 83rd, the sergeant said. They, they've shot the ribbons out of them, and all they can do is extend the line a bit. We're getting murdered on the flank. Can we extend, Chamberlain asked. There's nothing to extend, Tom answered. More than half of our men are down. And it was true. Chamberlain's command had started in Bangor, Maine six months earlier with a thousand men. They started that morning with 300 and now they were only 80 men strong. How are we for ammunition? The colonel asked. We've been shooting a lot, was his brother's answer. I know we've been shooting a lot, Chamberlain snapped. I want to know how we're holding out. How much ammunition do we have left? As Tom ran to check, a 12-year-old lookout had climbed a tree and he yelled. They're coming, forming up again. Chamberlain looked up to see the boy pointing down the hill. They're forming up right now, and they've been reinforced. Sir, there's a lot of them this time. At that moment, a messenger stumbled into their midst. Out of breath, he said, Sir Colonel Chamberlain, sir, Colonel Vincent is dead. Are you sure, soldier? Yes, sir, he gasped. He was shot right at the first of the fight. They were firmed up by Weed's brigade, but now Weed is dead. They moved Hazlitt's battery up top, and Hazlitt's dead too. Chamberlain's brother came running back. Joshua, he said, we're out. One, two rounds per man at the most. Some of the men don't have anything at all. Chamberlain turned to a thin man standing on his right side. It was First Sergeant Ellis Spear. Spear, he ordered, tell the boys to take the ammunition from the wounded and the dead. 
Uh, we did that last time, sir, Spear replied. Maybe we should think about pulling out. Chamberlain responded grimly, we will not be pulling out, Sergeant. Carry out my orders, please. Colonel, Sergeant Tozier spoke up. We won't hold them again, sir. You know we won't. Joshua, it was his brother. Here they come! Here they come! Chamberlain stepped to the top of the wall in full view, crossing his arms and staring down at the advancing enemy. The 15th and 47th Alabama, with their pale yellow-gray uniforms, now reinforced by a Texas regiment, moved up the hill as their high-pitched shriek. The rebel yell coursed up towards Chamberlain and his men. Sergeant Spear was standing at the colonel's feet. Sergeant Tozier, Chamberlain's brother Tom, and Lieutenant Melcher, the flag bearer, were huddled below. Joshua, his brother said, do something. <laughs> Give an order. Chamberlain stood there for a moment, deep in thought, quickly sorting the situation. We can't retreat, he thought, and we can't stay here. <laughs> When I'm faced with the choice of doing nothing or doing something, I will always choose to act. He turned his back on the advancing rebels looking down at his men, and he said, fix bayonets. At first, no one moved. They just stared at him with their mouths open. Fix your bayonets. Now, he commanded again, execute a great right wheel of the entire regiment. Swing the left first and do it now. Lieutenant Melcher spoke first, confused. Uh, Sir, he asked, what's a great right wheel? But the colonel had already jumped from the wall and was moving to the next group of men. Sergeant Tozier answered the question for him. He, he means to charge, son. <laughs> a great white wheel is an all-out charge. Then turning, the colonel pointed his sword directly downhill. Facing overwhelming odds, Chamberlain slashed his blade through the air with a power born of courage and fear. The school teacher from Maine roared, Charge! 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 The remaining 80 fighting men lifted their voices to match their leader. Charge, they cried, tumbling over the wall into history about which most people in our country haven't even heard about. For when the Confederate troops saw Chamberlain, the leader of the opposition, mount the wall, they immediately stopped. Unsure as to what was happening, and when the colonel pointed his sword toward them and commanded his men to charge, they turned and ran. Many threw down their loaded weapons. The rebels were certain that those were not the same soldiers that they had been facing. Surely these men have been reinforced, they thought. A beaten regiment would not charge. And in less than five minutes, Chamberlain had his sword on the collarbone of a Confederate captain. You, sir, are my prisoner, he stated. The man turned around a fully loaded Navy Colt revolver and offered it to Chamberlain. Yes, sir, he answered, I am. Within five more minutes, that ragged group of 80 men under Chamberlain's command without any ammunition captured over 400 soldiers of the enemy. It's an amazing story. But here's what's most amazing about it. Have you ever considered that historians actually have determined that if Chamberlain had not charged that day, the rebels probably would have won at Gettysburg. Further historians tell us that the rebels won at Gettysburg, the South would have won the war, and the war itself would have been over by the end of the summer. Most people assume that had the South won the war today, would, we would exist as two countries, the Union and the Confederate. Historians, however, insist that if the South had won the war, we would not live on a territorial fragmented continent much like Europe. North America would be divided into nine to 13 countries, which means, by the way, that when Hitler swept across Europe in the 40s, had Chamberlain not charged on that afternoon, there would not have existed a United States of America to stand in the breach. 
when Hirohito systematically invaded the islands of the South Pacific, there would not have been a country big enough, strong enough, wealthy enough, and populous enough to fight and win two wars on two fronts at the same time. The United States of America exists as it does today because of a single man, one 34-year-old school teacher and one move he made more than a century ago. You see, Chamberlain flapped his wings and it started a ripple effect. But you say, come on, I mean, Chamberlain, it was a war. He happened to be in that place. I don't live in that place. So I have you listen to the next story, if you don't mind. The person of the week, April 2, 2004. His name was Norman Borlaw. Borlaw is a he personally responsible for drastically and dramatically changing the world in which we live. You see, in the early 40s, Norman Borla hybridized high-yield disease-resistant corn and wheat for arid climates. From the Dust Bowl of Western Africa to our own desert southwest, from South and Central America to the plains of Siberia across Europe and Asia, Borla's specific seed product flourished and regenerated where no seed had ever thrived before. Through the years, it has been now calculated that Norman Borla's work saved from famine more than two billion people. Two billion. And by the way, it could have been some of you. Actually, it was never reported, but the anchorman was misinformed. It wasn't Norman Borla who saved two billion people, though very few caught the mistake. It was actually a man named Henry Wallace. Henry Wallace was the Vice President of the United States under Franklin Roosevelt. Now most of you know he had a couple of Vice Presidents, but there were three years when Henry Wallace was that. He was the former Secretary of Agriculture who after his one term of Vice President was dumped from the ticket. So while Wallace was Vice President, however, he used the power of that office to create a station in Mexico whose sole purpose was to hybridize corn and wheat for guess what? Arid climates. And he hired a young man named Norman Borla. Interestingly enough, now who actually, who's responsible for those two million lives? So Norman Borla won the Nobel Prize and Norman was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, but considering the connection, it was probably Henry Wallace. Or was it George Washington Carver? Remember the peanut? But here's something that very few people no, when Carver was 19 years old and a student at Iowa State University, he had a dairy science professor who, on Saturday and Sunday afternoons, would allow his six-year-old boy to go on botanical expeditions with the brilliant student. It was George Washington Carver who took the boy and instilled in him a love for plants and a vision for what they could do for humanity. It was George Washington Carver who pointed six-year-old Henry Wallace's life in a specific direction long before he ever became president of the United States of America. It's amazing to contemplate George Washington Carver flapped his butterfly wings. And by the way, he did so many things with other things. But then again, who is it? So maybe we should say George Washington was the person of the week, or maybe it was a farmer from Diamond, Missouri. Listen carefully. His name was Moses, and he lived in a slave state, but he didn't believe in slavery. This made him a target for psychopaths, like the Quattrell's raiders who terrorized the area by destroying property, by burning and killing. And sure enough, one cold January night, Quattrell's raiders rode through Moses' farm. The outlaws burned the barn, shot several people, and dragged off a woman named Mary Washington, who refused to let go of her infant son, George. Now, Mary Washington was a friend of Moses' wife, Susan. Though distraught, Susan promptly set out to work writing messages and contacting nearby farms. She got word through the neighbors and towns and two days later managed to secure a meeting for Moses with the bandits. So Susan looked on anxiously as her husband rode off on the black horse. His destination was a crossroad in Kansas several hours to the north. There at the appointed time, in the middle of the night, Moses met up with the four of Quattrell's raiders. They were on horseback carrying torches and had flour sacks tied over their heads with holes cut out for their eyes. 
There the farmer traded the only horse they had left on the farm for what the outlaws threw in him in a dirty burlap bag at his feet. As the bandits thundered off on their horses, Moses fell to his knees, and there, alone on the dark winter night, the farmer pulled from the bag a cold, naked, almost dead baby boy. Quickly he jerked open his coat and his shirt and placed the child next to his skin, covering them then with his own clothes and relying on the warmth from his own body. The man turned and walked the baby all the way home. Moses walked through the night into the next morning to get the child to Susan. There they committed to that tiny human being and to each other that they would care for him. They promised the boy an education to honor his mother, Mary, who they knew was already dead. That night they gave the baby their own name. And that is how Moses and Susan Carver came to raise that little baby, George Washington. So when you think about it, maybe it was the farmer from Diamond, Missouri who saved the two billion people. Or was it his wife who was responsible? Certainly, Susan had a bit to play in it. It was she who demanded immediate action. So who saved the two billion people? Could I suggest that they flapped their little wings and something changed? I don't know about you, sometimes I, I get sitting by myself and feeling sorry for myself that I don't matter. Anybody ever have that up? Uh, you don't have to say anything. I give you this text from Galatians. And I give it to you first in the message and then we'll look at it in the NIV. So let's not allow ourselves to get fatigued by doing good. At the right time we will harvest a good crop if we don't give up or quit. Yeah, that's a promise, did you know? For you teachers. <laughs> who work your fool heads off for young ones. Thank you for doing that. Because in time you never know what will come of that. And it says, goes on, it says, right now, therefore, every time we get the chance, let us work for the benefit of all, starting with the people closest to us in the community of faith. He doesn't say start out there with the unchurched. He says start in here with each other. By the way, Ellen White has some great stuff. I won't take time to take you there. But I encourage you to look about smiling and what Ellen White has to say about smiling. She talks a lot about that there are people in a place that are so dark that a smile can change their life. So I'm not talking about going out of here and creating a wheat that you can plant in arid climates. I'm talking about going out from here saying, what am I going to do today to somebody who's a member of this congregation that I wasn't going to do before so I can start the wings of flapping? That's sort of what I'm talking about. And I apologize for the largeness of this quote, but I want you to see, because Ellen White saw very clearly the same principle, and she's talking about Moses in this instance. Moses was dead, but his influence did not die with him. It was to live on reproducing itself in the hearts of his people, the memory of that holy, unselfish life would long be cherished with silent, persuasive power, molding the lives even of those who had neglected his living words. Isn't that interesting? He'll have no idea, some of the people that he's affected. You can imagine him dying going, I never touched that person. And in heaven he'll wake up and say, wow, you're here. As the glow, and then I love this, this quote, as the glow of the descending sun lights up the mountain peaks long after the sun itself has sunk behind the hills, so the works of the pure, the holy, and the good shed light upon the world long after the actors themselves have passed away. And she quotes scripture, actually. She says this, their works their words, their example, will, how often? Forever live. Forever live. And then she quotes the, the Psalms 112.6 that says, The righteous shall be an everlasting 
remembrance. I take you to Matthew 13 where you find the parable of the pearl of great price. The parable of the pearl of great price is a great story and we know that Jesus Christ is the pearl of great price and that we should sell everything and go out and buy the pearl of great price. Yes? Is that not true? The pen of inspiration also gives us another view of that parable. She says that you are the pearl of great price. And that Jesus Christ left heaven, left his land, left everything, went and bought the field so he could own you. So please today, I know this is not new to you, but maybe in this world's history right now, a reminder is good. That you value, you have value, and you make a difference. And no matter whether you're at home, ladies, and you're raising children, and you're being kind to them, and you think no one matters and no one cares, he does. Whether you're at work, and it's a droning job, and you just one piece of paper after the other, keep flapping your wings. Young people, wherever you are, by the way, you are also creating a difference right where you are now. What will it be down the road? So today, just one or two things I'd encourage you to leave here thinking about that you're going to do for the community of God today to maybe start something down the road. Maybe save a life. Who knows? But I do know that in his mind, it will matter. If you believe that, say amen. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus Christ, we don't get how you can call us the pearl. We get how you're the pearl. Sometimes it's not easy to understand. But right now, Lord, as you've given us this 80, 90, 100 years, I would just ask, Lord, that you would prompt us today to flap our so to speak, wings, to make changes that we can, that you have promised will live on for eternity. Live in us, abide in us, individually and as a community. That's our prayer today, in Jesus' name.